Awesome. Thanks everyone uh, for joining and let's kind of get started. So today I'm excited to talk with Nathan Benesh about the state of AI. Nathan's the founder and general partner of Airstreet Capital, a venture capital firm investing in early stage AI first technology and life science companies. Um, and Nathan's the co-author of the annual state of AI report and the newsletter, Your Guide to AI. Um, to get started, Nathan, what's what was your motivation for putting this report together and how did you get started? Yeah, thanks so much for having me, Elliot. So I'm really looking forward to the discussion. Um, so a couple of years ago, uh, Ian Hogarth and I uh, kind of met up in a cafe and, um, and you know, we'd both been monitoring like basically the state of AI over several years. Um, him uh, as an undergrad doing machine learning several years ago and then through his entrepreneurial experience at Songkick and then as an angel investor. And on my side, doing grad school work in more computational bio um, and using ML techniques in uh, genetics research. And then laterally making investments in early stage startups and then, um, you know, meeting a large kind of proportion of the ecosystem. And we basically thought that, you know, we're in this sort of uh, unique vantage point um, where we interface with small companies, big companies, government policymakers um, and investors, which gives us a pretty cool vantage point over uh, you know, where the puck is going in machine learning. And we um, felt it would basically just be like a fun project to kind of cobble together what we thought were the most interesting trends, sort of like a mixtape, if you will, um, mm -hmm. and then just put it online uh, as a public good. And, uh, you know, one thing kind of led to another and, you know, a few people really liked it the first year round and we tried to get a little bit more sophisticated and, um, and add some more structure around it. And, um, and it's really there as a, as a public good for anybody to consume. So we can try and level up the conversation about, you know, this pretty exciting technique and, and field, but, you know, one with um, tons of noise. No, I've, I've always really appreciated reading it. And I really appreciate the kind of data driven first analysis that you, you guys put into it. Um, from, from this year's report, you, you make about eight predictions for about the next 12 months, including Transformers replacing a lot of the work with recurrent networks, consolidating in the AI semiconductor market, kind of small hybrid models matching state of the art, and new frameworks like JAX developing, um, and also went over eight predictions from last year's report. When, when you look back at the predictions from last year and how they came to pass or didn't, what was the most surprising for you? I think. Um maybe the the most surprising one was just how uh, how widespread the expansion of transformers from NLP into almost every other machine learning task has been. You know, we, we predicted that it would be applied in computer vision. And, you know, we saw that with the vision transformer setting new benchmarks on ImageNet, but we didn't necessarily think that it would expand it to chemistry, like reaction prediction of, you know, molecule A plus molecule B equals 50% of molecule C and, 40% of molecule D, et cetera. Um, and we had an idea that, um, you know, biology was going through its AI moment <clears throat> as was tracked by a number of papers and interest and, and kind of early findings, but we didn't necessarily think that like such a large swath of biology and drug discovery would also be applicable to transformers. Um, so I think that's like probably the, the sort of biggest prediction or the biggest like, kind of surprise, the widespread nature of our transformers. And out of the predictions for the, this coming year, what do you think is the most important or will have the biggest impact in the state of AI? Um, I mean, we, we, we spent a lot of time in this report um, kind of digging into the semiconductor supply chain. And mm -hmm. we you know noticed that a lot of the mainstream news sort of came online to realizing how complex and interweaved um, the supply chain is ranging from you know procurement of materials to uh, processing those materials to you know the machines that etch um, very small patterns on silicon uh, that you know is used by TSMC and other businesses and uh, and how you know these supply chains are incredibly uh, tight knit and benefited a lot from globalization and um, uh, and specialization uh, in different countries and now we see almost like a reversion over towards. Uh, you know, more onshoring and, and the tensions that this, uh, that is created on a global scale and, uh, you know, supply chain shortages and things like that uh, is a pretty major trend that we think is going to accelerate in the next 12 months. And is one of the reasons why we predicted that ASML, um, you know, business that I think many people mm -hmm. hadn't heard of 
before that makes these extreme ultraviolet light um, uh, you know, machines to etch patterns on silicon will grow significantly in market cap kind of driven by these kinds of geopolitical tailwinds. And, and for, I guess for you personally, which is the one that you'd be most excited about seeing come true? I mean, I'm, I'm kind of a science nerd <laughs> to us. So like, I'm, I'm really looking forward to, you know, even more fundamental science problems getting solved um, with machine learning. And, um, and we made one prediction that, you know, DeepMind would make another breakthrough in the physical sciences. And uh, we had like a little internal debate on our group chat as to whether mathematics is a physical science or not a physical science, but uh, there was a cool nature paper uh, on the cover just a few weeks ago. Um, actually a friend from grad school worked on um, where they helped mathematicians solve complex knot mm -hmm. problems. Um, so I'm kind of excited to sort of seeing machine learning go into physical sciences like space or, uh, mm -hmm. or quantum or things like this. Well, as a recovering mathematician, I'll definitely say that I, I appreciate the, the work that AI is doing there. Um, yeah. But kind of going to Transformers, like you, you guys were definitely right that 2021 was the year when Transformers really saw breakout success and domains outside of NLP. Can you give some examples of some of those really exciting use cases and like what areas you see it expanding into in the future? Yeah, so, um, you know, we mentioned the vision transformer on, on ImageNet, but um, we also saw, you know, brand new uh, performance benchmarks on speech recognition with, you know, mm -hmm. the lowest word error rate um, getting hit using transformers. And um, we also highlighted uh, more work in computer vision focused around 3D point cloud classification and segmentation. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, and in particular, like we have a big section on, on AI first approaches to biology and the two kind of coolest mm -hmm. applications that, that, that I found was, uh, both involving NLP sort of transformer models, where in the first instance, there was a group at Salesforce research that made use of these same models that would be applicable to translating a sentence from one language to another or predicting the next token in a, in a sentence and using that on a large uh, body of proteins. Mm -hmm. And from that, basically figuring out the sort of language of proteins so that you can um, basically ask the model to generate a sequence with a particular function. And the coolest bit of all of that is that uh, you can get this model to generate a protein that has never existed in nature mm -hmm. and has kind of de novo properties that are of, of uh, sort of industrial uh, importance and interest. And the second one is sort of relevant more towards the pandemic. And, and there was a group at MIT that used, again, similar uh, NLP models to effectively learn um, the grammar of the spike protein on the virus mm -hmm. to figure out what kinds of mutations might occur in the spike protein that would confer a higher fitness, um, you know, as is expressed by a, uh, a virus that's more able to bind to the receptor uh, in the human body or less. And then you can kind of use this or, or kind of roll forward what you might do with this kind of approach, which could include things like generating more proactively these mRNA vaccines and thinking about sort of an AI first approach towards mRNA mm -hmm. uh, vaccine design. That's definitely exciting. I, I'm personally excited about the fact that as all these problems are tackled by the same type of framework, it becomes easier and easier to do multimodal learning and, and incorporate insights from all these different input streams at the same time. Yeah, yeah, it's really remarkable, like the, the transferability of these models in different domains. And we got asked this question of like, how is it that a research group at Salesforce that makes enterprise software is able to, you know, like have a big impact in a field that presumably they have kind of no direct mm -hmm. experience in. And, and I think the fact that that's possible is sort of a, a hat tip towards the generalizability of the representations of these models are, are learning. Well, and now that they've made this jump from NLP to computer vision and kind of all these different use cases, where do you feel like they can make the biggest impact on, on industry? Um, we, so one of the sections that uh, in the report that sort of expresses this is um, there's so many more uh, companies nowadays that are implementing these transformer models for various like natural language tasks. Um, so obviously you see like the rise of hugging face, but also cohere um, and, and, you know, several other businesses that are prioritizing these large language models mm -hmm. through APIs. Um, I think there, you know, the surface area domain applications, everything from, you know, legal contract review to next word predictions sort or of like a better Grammarly, um, to, you know, translation of documents, et cetera. So I think it's just about making like all those applications that were pretty good, like 
good enough that now customers are willing mm -hmm. to pay for them and depend on them. Um, and perhaps going into, you know, even more kind of vertical domains, like, you know, understanding, um, you know, medical records and, mm -hmm. um, and, you know, understanding kind of minutiae of, of, uh, of, uh, of basically like legalese that is not necessarily present on Wikipedia. Um, I think it's going to be quite a bit of, mm -hmm. um, of work going on there too. So, so breaking away from transformers is as exciting as they are. Like a lot of, a lot has been made of the advances in like unsupervised learning and the enterprise value always seems to be just around the corner. And some yeah. of the exciting cases are things like data discovery and bootstrapping for transfer learning and things like that. Where do you, where do different forms of learning play a role in industry? Should every team start with weak learning or should it be a, a bit more nuanced than that? Yeah. I feel like the general advice is like, start with the simplest approach possible. Mm -hmm. to just even figure out whether like the task you're trying to solve is like machine learnable. Um, I think there's this, you know, challenge where academia is publishing amazing state of the art results with like super sexy models. And then you have this dichotomy of what the reality is in industry. And, um, to some degree, you know, which models actually make commercial sense to run mm -hmm. and maintain, et cetera. So always start with the simplest and then, um, and then I think that like starting with something simple helps you really understand the domain and the problem that you're working on so that you can understand like which areas might you go into next? Is it, you know, more complex architectures? Is it better data? Is it maybe an ensemble of models um, that can eke out the performance you need to solve whatever business problem you have? Um, so that's usually kind of what I, what I think about. Um, and certainly for data discovery, you know, unsupervised learning is, um, is super valuable. And we see that a lot with our computer vision companies. And like on that train, isn't it easier to or to start with a weak learning approach or some of these semi-supervised learnings before going in and creating massive labeling pipelines and spinning up all those things if you don't have data already or if you're just trying to validate an idea? Um, yeah, it could be. I think it kind of depends on the sort of business you are. Like if you're if you're sort of an AI first company, it's going to make sense that you you know, start with the data platform, like really figure out your annotation schema, really figure out your task and what kind of models you can use, et cetera, so that you're building up for success longer term. But if you're a business that's more of non-machine learning software and you're trying to iterate quickly on a feature and test it out, um, then, you know, you might find a pre-trained model, you know, on GitHub or something, um, or, or you might be able to use a more weekly supervised model, like, mm -hmm. you know, using these labeling functions, for example, to sort of get, get somewhere a bit faster. Um, so I think it sort of depends what flavor of a business you are, what kind of resources you have and, uh, and sort of what you're building long-term, like is machine learning a core competency to you? Does it define your product or is it mm -hmm. like a nice to have? Awesome. So in your report, you state that with increasing power and availability of models, gains from model improvements have become kind of marginal. And in this context, the ML community, community is increasingly aware of the importance of better data and more generally better ML ops to build reliable products. Yeah. Uh, where, what do you see as the place of ML, top, ML ops tooling that's valuable and like what should people be thinking about there? Yeah, I mean, there's, um, as you mentioned, there's like a real resurgence in interest and focus on data being a differentiator as opposed to models. Um, I think that's one of the, also the main differences between academia and, um, and industry. And it's, um, you know, a function of, Issues like models not being great when there's data drift, uh, issues of potentially bias like creeping in, um, and uh, and so that's that's ultimately like driving people to focus to okay like how am I collecting, how am I annotating data, and do I have um, proper checks and balances in place to to make sure that my models are learning something useful, and as my customer behavior changes or I onboard new kinds of customers, then my models are like robust to those sorts of changes. Um, and so I think like the, the cool thing I've seen certainly in the investing landscape is <clears throat> whereas a couple of years ago, call it like 2015, the sort of early generation of deep learning businesses that, uh, that started, you know, there was no SaaS offering for a labeling platform. And so these companies had to sort of hack something together with internal resource. Um, and then over time is, you know, some of those businesses became bigger and like had real AR generating, um, products then um, sort of realize like resource is scarce and it doesn't necessarily make sense to build and manage these internal mm -hmm. tools anymore. And then 
you know, as more and more vision companies came into the market, they then created, uh, you know, they amplified that pain basically to the point that some engineers were like, well, maybe we can build a SaaS product for this. And so I think it's a, um, the fact that now data platforms have emerged as, as a SaaS offering and are sort of no longer considered to be a competitive advantage, but almost like a table stakes to be competitive um, mm -hmm. is a sign of the maturity of these companies and of the market in general. Uh, and so now it's sort of like almost becomes a de facto choice of like, okay, I'm going to start a vision company. Like I need to buy a data platform, which one am I going to buy? And it sort of depends on what your use case is and, you know, certain developer preferences, et cetera. Yeah. So, so following on from that, like Chris Ray group really launched a data centric AI repo on GitHub to aggregate resources, entering deep learning AI is organizing a, a data centric AI competition. Um, where people are asked, given a fixed model, to, to modify the data to get the best performance. And, and you can even see it extending to this year's NERPS conference going on right now, where we have multiple different venues for people to highlight their work only on the data sets and, and the data-centric AI. Are, are those viewpoints um, on data-first modeling just an academic angle, or is this be, becoming pervasive in industry as well? I think it's, it's certainly being pervasive in, in industry, and I think Certainly, Chris Ray's group is is one of the like extremely industrial focused labs where they really mm -hmm. take problems that exist in the real world and do research on on that. Um, so he's extremely pragmatic in that regard, and you know, Andrew Ng is probably somewhat similar. Mm -hmm. So, um, so I think I think this trend is certainly here to stay. Uh, I think it's just a question of like what we call this. Uh, uh, you know, these kind of monikers are changing all the time and. Is it a data platform? Is it data centric? Is it model centric? We, we don't really know yet, but the trend is is definitely here to stay. Um, and in the report, we profile a few kind of trends in that regard, like uh, active benchmarking uh, to make sure that you know, like basically models can see more real world scenarios, uh, and where those benchmarks are constantly updated by human users. Um, also, data sets that kind of tackle distribution shifts, as we kind of discussed, and and kind of finally. This notion of under uh, under specification, um, which is also another kind of problem that manifests in, uh, in in industry, where basically data set where basically models mm -hmm. can perform slightly differently depending on how you initialize them, which is like mm -hmm. slightly scary. Um, yeah. So yeah. Do, do you feel like this approach will pay more dividends for for academia or, or for industry in, in I guess different way? Do you think this will help kind of close the gap that we've seen between? how ML works in, in industry and academia. Yeah, I think um, I think it's gonna create like a faster sort of on-ramp between folks who graduate from academia and then mm -hmm. want to go into industry and how quickly can they become effective? Um, because we're sort of teaching industrial relevant principles uh, in the academic setting. And I also think like it's, it's largely uh, kind of overdue in a way because you know, whereas in, you know, you guys at scale, like you generate all these amazing high quality data sets. And, you know, a lot of people in academia are still like working on kitty data sets that are like incredibly pixelated and you know, generate, I don't know how many years ago. And so I think there's, there's like this kind of interplay between, you know, bigger companies and startups that can generate high quality data sets. And then we can all agree that, you know, data centric um, AI is the right way to go. And then there can be a lot of cross pollination of these data sets so that, you know, Academics when they're trained and future engineers when they're trained are kind of working on the same subject on the same substance, um, and have more like industrial relevant um, skill sets. So, uh, kind of going to some of the stuff you were talking about earlier on this, the semiconductors and why it's so important. Like twenty twenty one was really the year of novel AI semiconductors and supply chain chaos. Also, we're seeing governments across the world turn their attention and, and money towards the semiconductor production problem. Um, historically, once a business or region has kind of lost its lead, it's almost impossible to catch up. And the U.S. kind of transferred a lot of that knowledge and, and industry to Japan more than 30 years ago with, with mm. memory and things like that. How realistic is it for the AI industry to move away from like a single highly, influ highly influential region for production? I think that's like a trillion dollar question, um, literally based on like the investments that mm. you know, big companies are making. And uh, we, we looked at, again, like the kind of concentration in this industry and in particular, like some reports that looked at how expensive it would be to replicate uh, mm -hmm. like the value chain uh, in Europe and in the United States. And 
it was something like, you know, despite uh, you, you know, the US and Europe kind of earmarking 200 billion to sort of, you know, onshore back uh, semiconductor capabilities, achieving sovereignty over the whole value chain would cost over a trillion dollars. Mm -hmm. And so that's almost um, six times the combined R&D investment and capital expenditure of the entire semiconductor value chain in 2019. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's, it's an incredibly uphill, steep uphill battle. Um, in a way, though, it's, you know, if you're a policymaker, it's almost something that you you have to you have to do, I think, mm -hmm. um, uh, just based on the way like, geopolitics is working out. But I think it's about maybe being tactical over uh, what parts of the value chain are you actually going to try and mm -hmm. onshore? Because, you know, things like minerals are maybe a lot more difficult for certain countries to onshore because they just physically don't exist. Mm -hmm. in their country but you know capability capabilities like lithography maybe not for the super leading edge you know minuscule nanometer processes but for the more kind of run-of-the-mill chips that you get in cars and things like this we can uh, have a better shot of having domestic domestic players um and 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 does it feel like those kind of really core steps in the value chain are, are possible for people to bring up are we seeing investment being made in those areas there's a, there's a lot of commitments getting getting mm -hmm. made and then certain domestic players that uh like in germany um that are uh they're kind of stepping up to the plate and saying you know we're going to build we're going to build capability i mean of course like intel has been making a lot of mm -hmm. um you know positive um signals and commitments in that regard but i think it's just this industry just takes a lot of time to spin up and um and a, and a ton of highly competent individuals of which there are not very many mm -hmm. um so I'm, I'm like very, very, very cautiously optimistic that we can actually make a real dent in this. Um, if we focus on the, like the leading edge processes and, mm -hmm. and more bullish on the uh, less leading edge processes, which, you know, don't require a kind of TSMC level expertise to, mm -hmm. to, um, to affect. And, and how has the recent kind of uncertainty in the silicon market affected companies with respect to like their AI investments and what bets they're choosing to place? Um, well, it's certainly, it's certainly been the benefactors basically been NVIDIA, I think <laughs> over the, over the last like 12 months, it's, it's, it's just amazing to see that ever since they announced the acquisition of arm, like in September last year for like 40 some billion, the market cap of NVIDIA has just doubled. And so the acquisition is almost, well, it's definitely free basically at this point. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, but companies, I think, are are increasingly, I mean, still turning to to cloud offerings uh, as opposed to buying their own buying their own racks and managing their own racks. But beneficiaries still like Nvidia and then you know various cloud service providers like AWS and Google. Um, and then of course on the gov side and kind of research side, it's where you know more of the specialized semiconductor companies have have made some headway. Um, yeah. Awesome. Um, so like autonomous driving and recommendation systems are some of the most pervasive and arguably some of the most effective forms of AI right now. And one thing in common is that developing those systems and those models relies on large investments in like ML ops and, and ML infrastructure. And, and Tesla has even gone so far as helping popularize the idea of, of operation vacation and having infrastructure play a similar role in creating the AI advancements itself. Um, for, for people that want to start working with those ideas, like what's the order of investments that they should think about? What should they do now versus what's important to think about more later on? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so I generally think no, number one is sort of like problem scoping and problem framing so that you understand like what task you're trying to solve, like what does good look like? What does bad look like? Is there a good way of, of, uh, of expressing this? Number two, I would say that it's uh, basically data collection and annotation as we as we kind of discussed and you know, trying to pull from best in class models that are publicly available. Uh, then if it looks like there's some success there, then I think investing more in data platform model training and evaluation. And then mm -hmm. once like the business case is even proven there, then I think you can start moving towards the monitoring and observability. Um, uh kind of problem set really mm -hmm. uh which is like, bubbling a lot and lots of venture funding is going into this direction um but i think the companies that really feel the pain are ones that have large-scale deployments um in potentially you know 
high stakes environments and where like the pain of mistakes is either felt by customers being unhappy or the business jeopardizing certain revenue uh, opportunities. I think like investing observability before you have a product in the market or before you have large scale is like probably not the best use of money, at least in my opinion. And, and how customizes MLOps infrastructure to the specific problem that people are trying to take on? That's a good question. Uh, it's, I don't, I don't envy like engineering leaders kind of making, um, mm -hmm. design decisions and infrastructure decisions nowadays, because the number of new companies and solutions and open source that come onto the market, uh, every like six months or something is, is beyond, uh, beyond what you'd want. Uh, if you're making a long-term decision and you want like stable foundations, almost like you're building a house on sand. Um, so it's, uh, I don't know, I guess it's hard. <laughs> it's like my, uh, my kind of sense. And, and the other kind of, uh, interesting thing that comes out of that is then, you know, more companies are opting towards, uh, modular solutions in my experience, what I've seen versus like fully end-to-end -end solutions just so that they can, you know, best take advantage of, um, mm -hmm of new components that come online or open source tools that come online or just like internal tools that they'd rather patch up mm -hmm. um, instead of making that, you know, huge commitment of we're going to build everything on this platform and it might not be the best for certain parts. Yeah. My modularity and like API driven first is, is definitely yeah. some good properties. Like what are, in your opinion, some of the, the other properties that are really valuable to have in an MLOps platform? Um, yeah, portability, being able to run in, in various cloud environments. Mm -hmm. um, um, I think the other, the other thing that would be that would be good is that it's not just a tool that engineers can use, but that you know data analysts can use or less technical product mm -hmm. managers can use. So because they're on the other end of the of the value chain, because um, that really because it's like the platform has to basically uh, reflect the multidisciplinary nature of teams that build and deliver. Uh, you know, quality ML products. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it's like probably even more diverse than regular so uh, software products. Um, and so having different team members that can come into the platform and then figure out um, how things are working, why things are working, and mm -hmm. how they can all, um, you know, opine and improve the system is of value. So um, for, for an ML engineer who, who doesn't necessarily see why it's valuable for like their project manager or, or some of the executives to be able to come in and understand and work in the platform, like what would you say to them? What, what's, what's the reason why they should, they should value that? Well, because I, I think if, um, if, if you as an individual are kind of you know, working in a team, you all want to row in the, in the same direction and you mm -hmm. want to understand what is the overall goal that you're all trying to achieve. And, and having like the same communication language is very important. Um, and so if there are silos around, you know, a non-technical person who uh, is responsible for, you know, handling customer, if, if that individual is not capable of interfacing with you as an engineer, because you don't speak the same language and you can't like dig into the tool and try and figure out how you might integrate customer feedback into a way the engineer understands, then you're not really rowing in the same direction. You're just going to be like less effective as a team. That would be like mm -hmm. the intuitive thing I would say. Um, yeah, one thing I found is that if a lot of times if you're if you're teaching the product managers and the people that are working with you like how to use these tools, a lot of the like smaller requests, a lot of the things that that might disrupt your time or, or take away from the things you're trying to do, they can effectively self serve and it can actually create people that understand what you're trying to do a lot better. Yeah, this is true. I mean, an example uh, I saw recently is in the data quality space mm -hmm. um, is, you know, somebody who works on the product side or with customers that's taking the output of some model um, and then using it to make a business decision or like serving a customer is going to have a very good sense over like, is there something wonky with this data? And um, they need to be able to communicate that to you know, the edge team that is responsible for handling the data at the source and mm -hmm. doing whatever transformations with it, training a model, et cetera. Um, Cause that, that individual on the end side might not see the customer side. And, and so like working on it as a multidisciplinary team means that um, again, like you can get right into what the problem is and, mm -hmm. and fix it in a way that you're not trying to kind of throw stuff over the fence. Yep. And what do you see as the role of AI itself within someone's MLOps platform? 
like how could you use ML within an MLS platform? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or, or well, is, I guess that, like, is that a place you should? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think yeah, like yes, to some degree. And I'd probably cite the data quality example again, um, because in a way you only want high quality data in your data platform that's being used to train mm -hmm. models. And so you can already think about filtering, for example, in AVs, like the, I don't know how much data these cars generate, but like way too much to even store over mm -hmm. a decent amount of time. And so filtering through that data and figuring out like, what should I keep? What should I throw away? That's a perfect machine learning problem. Um, mm -hmm. And then, um, and then like trying to figure out what additional data point might I need, might I need um, based on the performance of the system that I have in production uh, in order to improve, you know, performance on that particular class label. Uh, it's also a machine learning problem. So I think in that sense, like focusing on some of the um, rate limiting steps uh, mm -hmm. is a value. And then I think the, the second bit is actually in the annotation flow itself. I mean, you can think about it as, you know, interplay between, you know, some human experts, maybe a model can do a model based annotation at the star and then a mm -hmm. human corrects it. Maybe there are other, you know, people or models that you might want to, uh, you know, pass data through like, you know, first OCR it and then, and then read the text and et cetera. So I think, uh, focusing on the, the modular nature of these labeling flows mm -hmm. and where can you inject a model instead of a person is another way, um, that machine learning can, can be useful in an NLL platform. Yeah, it sounds like the idea behind like amplifying humans, like using ML to to take something that humans are doing and make it have a significantly larger impact is is really powerful. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, for example, just focusing on where is there something interesting in a in an mm -hmm. image, like instead of having a human like spend time parsing through that, you can have a model parse through that or basic object <laughs> recognition, segmentation, etc. Okay. Um, so like data deserts is a, is a topic that comes up a lot in, in biomedical AI research and is yeah. likely a cause of a lot of bias when you use, when these models are used in clinical settings. Um, can you, can you define like, what is a data desert and what should people take away from it? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so basically a, a data desert, it reflects a situation where, um, your model is being trained on a data set that just does not represent the entirety of the of like, for example, the population uh, uh, that you want your model to serve. Mm -hmm. So the best example is maybe, uh, you know, biomedical data about, uh, you know, patients who have uh, cancer, for example. Um, if you're trying to build a system that can work across the entire United States, but your data set is only representative of people from California and people who live in New York, then you're missing like the vast majority of the U.S. population. And therefore you're training your model on a too small subset and therefore it's mm -hmm. called a desert. And, uh, and, and this notion is becoming, um, uh, more and more prescient because mm -hmm. now we're starting to see, uh, like a bunch of companies develop, you know, imaging processing, um, technologies and you know, applying to the FDA for FDA clearance and then applying for Medicare for reimbursement. Mm -hmm. And, um, if we want to scale the impact of these models across different jurisdictions, that stuff's really important. Um, and so to illustrate it, there was a, a study out of Stanford that looked at 56 different papers published over a kind of five year window from 15 to 2019 that made use of a deep learning algorithm, um, uh, to basically distinguish, uh, uh, you know, one of several, um, several elements in an image. And what they found was in these studies, 71% of them used the patient cohort from only one of three states. And 34 states didn't contribute any data. Mm -hmm. um, that's like one example. And then there's another example, which looked more at like gene expression data sets. And they found, you know, significant lack of certain ethnicities and certain, uh, you know, overrepresentation of sex or, or age. Mm -hmm. um, and then that obviously causes problems because it's huge hu human diversity that these models are not, um, are not trained to, to process and, and learn from. So how, how can people identify if the problem that they're trying to tackle is, is part of a data desert or not? There it's mostly about like having rigorous, um, mm -hmm. uh, evaluation, um, uh, sort of practices so that you're not just like doing test and train on a very similar data set, but you're looking at out of, uh, out of distribution samples, you're looking at, uh, 
you know, it, again, in, in medicine, like if I have a system that works well in the UK, does, can I get access to a data set in Germany or other, or other countries? So it's all about just falling into the general notion of like robustness and generalizability. And if there's a lack of generalizability, you know, it could be because of a data desert. Um, awesome. So AR and VR is an area that a lot of people have been working on for a while. And like last year in your state of AR report, you predicted that Facebook would make a, a major breakthrough um, with respect to 3D computer vision. Um, that, that really didn't happen. What does that say about the state of computer vision for AR VR? Was this specific to Facebook or is this kind of point to some broader challenges? Yeah. Yeah, I didn't really come out with anything that we thought fit the bill. I mean, they had their workplace kind of VR uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> experience, but we didn't feel that that really cut it. Um, I mean, to, to me, it seems like most of the like AR VR computer vision is done largely by gaming companies like Niantic with their mm -hmm. Pokemon Go experiences and trying to like learn 3D point clouds of the world and compute depth so you can kind of render these 3D characters mm -hmm. and um, in a, in a better in a better way for players mm -hmm. um but i suspect with you know now fet now meta's uh, huge investment dedicated to uh, you know quote unquote metaverse and i know they're building teams and envision um for these kinds of use cases and you know the other glasses product etc so it seems like now there's like a proper motivation to try and crack some of these problems mm -hmm. um and i would also imagine that like separately uh, in the politics section, we profiled how Microsoft had this enormous contract with the DOD for mm -hmm. selling HoloLens. And you can imagine, I can imagine a lot of use cases around 3D vision for, um, for basically troops in the battlefield, um, that they might be working on. So, um, I guess if this meta thing, metaverse thing pans out, then <laughs> we're likely to see a lot more 3D vision applications. And, and why is like computer vision for, for AR and VR such a challenging field? Is there something intrinsic about the problem? Could be. Um, I mean, I guess certain things come to mind is like the world is just a, uh, uh, like a mm -hmm. rapidly changing place. That's just like really complicated, um, to represent. And, um, and I just don't know if we have like the best training data sets for this, um, like even learning things like uh, kind of intuitive physics from video is still like incredibly mm -hmm. hard. Um, and then to some degree, because AR and VR is almost by definition, like an edge application, then mm -hmm. you don't have like unlimited power and compute budgets and you need something to be super snappy real time. And, and you're sort of competing with somebody's eyes. And so like, people are very good at, at noticing these like subtle uh, discrepancies between reality and something mm -hmm. virtual. So if it's not anything less than excellent and it's not good enough, I'd say probably some of those things come to mind as to why it might be challenging, but I'm sure there's a, a bunch mm -hmm. of much, much more deeply technical reasons why that probably be on uh, my pay grade. Yeah. Anytime you have computers interacting with the world world, the, the long tail of edge cases tends to be really fun and really challenging. <laughs> Explosively complex. Yeah. Um, so one thing for everyone listening, if you do have questions, um, please put them in the chat and we'll get them, get them added in, um, to what we're talking about. Um, so in the report, you, you talk about AI safety and that it's really top of mind right now, but fewer than 50 researchers are really working in the domain full time, um, at kind of major AI labs and, and within AI safety, AI alignment is like the critical field of research exploring how we can ensure that AI systems have goals that are aligned with what their, their researchers are trying to work on. And in, in this field, there's um, across seven leading organizations, there's less than a hundred researchers working on the, this problem, which is really a tiny fraction of the AI community. Um, if this transformational AI might happen in the next 30 years, like are too few researchers actively focusing on making sure it goes well for everyone? It's a good question. That, that's exactly the one that we wanted to provoke with the report. Mm -hmm. You know, not necessarily saying that it has to be a specific number or a specific percentage. <clears throat> it's more just the, you know, increasing number of, of researchers like feel that um, mm -hmm. that we should prioritize AI safety and then that we should do probably something proactive about it. 
And so we looked at a, a survey back in 2016 that asked AI researchers how they felt um, about the importance of AI safety. And it was about 49% that thought it should be a priority. And then now it's about 68%. It's across like 524 researchers published in mm -hmm. major conference venues. Um, and it is, it is difficult to pin down the exact, the exact number, uh, because certain teams kind of, uh, call their employees slightly differently, uh, in this kind of domain. But we just think that if there is a non, a non-zero probability that, as you say, transformational AI can happen, it sort of feels that, you know, this number of a hundred researchers is probably too small. Um, and, uh. Uh, and so, and we also break out alignment from safety because alignment is like much more of this, uh, kind of long-term, uh, long-term endeavor and safety is in a way, perhaps a bit more short-term and can be mm -hmm. potentially like bundled with generalizability, robustness, et cetera. Um, and it's slightly more actionable for, for more teams to think about. Mm -hmm. So, um, like how, what are, what are researchers kind of thinking about in terms of AI safety? Are they, are they coming to the problem from like test driven AI or uncovering edge cases, or are there more novel strategies that people are developing? Um, yeah, there's, there's some of, there's some of this, there's, you know, interpretability work, mm -hmm. um, that's also happening. Um, and then there's to some degree, some of the more like kind of philosophical and ethical points around mm -hmm. like. Are there certain things that we should try not to develop or certain ways that we could like limit distribution of, uh, of, of technical capabilities. Um, and then there's to some degree, like how to inject like, uh, like values and, um, sort of, uh, like decision-making principles, uh, to autonomous systems. Um, mm -hmm. but, but yeah, like what's kind of fascinating with this degree, with this discipline is that it touches, you know, philosophy, ethics, uh, mm -hmm. law, uh, machine learning, math, policy, et cetera. So it's a, it's a, it's a real potpourri of challenging domains that has to come together mm -hmm. to figure out like what is, what is pragmatic and what is, um, what can be like actionable by, by the rest of the community. Mm -hmm. I mean, something I've been thinking about around AI safety is how, is, how important is it for people to know when they're interacting with the output of a model with, or even which model they're interacting with. Yeah. Yeah. I think that, yeah, it's almost a question of, uh, of how do you build trust with, with a user of a digital system in a way. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, you know, potentially in a way that I don't know how, how scalable, how realistic it is to, to implement, um, something like that, given that, given how, uh, how broadly applied mm -hmm. machine learning systems are. I'm just imagining like a call center that says that you're, you're recorded for training purposes. Mm -hmm. Uh, or it's like, uh, you know, your clicks on this website are used for machine learning training purposes. Um, but in, in a way, like for sensitive domains, probably over communication or being transparent just builds more trust than, um, you know, users figuring out through the back door that something's happening that they didn't expect. And, and if a company wants to invest in AI safety and AI alignment and help move the field along, what's important for them to know and get right from the beginning? I think to some degree, uh, because it's such a long-term uh, mm -hmm. discipline or a long-term kind of trajectory, I think having, having those kinds of teams not be on like commercial deadlines and not be under like commercial pressure uh, really engaging with, with this community because it is very, very small and tight knit. Um, mm -hmm. and also to some degree, I think building in the open is super important. Um, it's a lot of great work that, you know, various researchers have done over the years that we tried to profile in last year's mm -hmm. report and, in, and in this one, um, awesome. Yeah. So, uh, a couple questions from the audience coming in for for data pipelines and kind of data flow tools, do you see any, any trends or, or winners emerging? Mm, I don't have a super good answer on that, to be honest. Um, yeah, I don't pass. So, so nothing is this fine. Um, yeah, I, I don't have, yeah, nothing. Um, so are, are for folks working on better ways to anonymize or, or pseudo anonymize data, um, going into models? Yeah, I mean, I can opine on this one. Um, yeah, I mean, like th this overall just handles the question of like privacy and can you compute mm -hmm. on private data? It's been a, I think, a really hot 
domain in in academia and then in mm -hmm. more kind of fringe applications in uh, in companies. Um, so there's like you know the federated learning um, kind of setting where you send the model to where the data lives and train there. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you have, as mentioned here, pseudonymization or hashing of certain data points. So it's also like kind of training uh, a generative model on a data set and then using it as a synthetic, as a source of synthetic data that represents the same probability distribution. Um, and uh, and then there's a little bit on like homomorphic encryption kind of mm -hmm. methods, like how can you compute on encrypted data? I think over, overall, all these are like extremely exciting techniques that I think are still pretty nascent with like what industry problems are they relevant for? Mm -hmm. um, the, the two that kind of pop out is one ad tech, like in a post cookie world, how do you, mm -hmm. how do you serve like relevant ads to people that you can't track all over the place? And, uh, and there, there's been some pretty cool work, um, through Chrome and brave running mm -hmm. FL in the browser. Um, and, uh, <clears throat> and then the second kind of domain is on life sciences and how can you, how can you share patient data across, uh, across, mm -hmm. uh, boundaries. Um, and there's been some cool work from open mind and, uh, and a few academic centers trying to, uh, build a federated, um, radiology, uh, software solution. Um, because in theory, like medical systems would be amazing if we managed to, you know, like assimilate or aggregate data from a physician in the U S and a physician in Europe, like that, that would be like a super physician. And so, mm -hmm. um, so it seems like FL is like a good way to, to get, to get there. Mm -hmm. Um, but I'd say like still, still fairly early days, like, uh, industry wise. Yeah. It kind of seems like going back to the, the data desert discussion that there are these, there are some pockets of ML where federated learning is almost a mandatory before you, yeah. you could see real, real gains there. Yeah. Yeah. And the other, the other thing I asked myself too, is like, what is the best company that owns this and mm -hmm. what is the best uh, way to distribute, um, these, these capabilities? because like FL in a way is almost like edge computing kind of, you can think mm -hmm. of it. Uh, so in that sense, like the, the best owner of it is probably the browser or the operating system mm -hmm. than it is like a third party company that needs to run across all these, um, these different devices. Um, so I think kind of jury's still out as to whether you're an Apple or Google or Brave or something like this, um, is the fastest to implement like a commercially relevant FL solution. Mm -hmm. And, and kind of given all the different types of ML people are doing, are there certain input data types or, or problem domains where FL has been working significantly better? Um, I mean, certainly like non real time applications, <laughs> I'd say. Uh, but like it started basically in, in text, uh, mm -hmm. you know, I think Google's team in Seattle was one of the first to sort of demonstrate, um, federated learning and, you know, they picked like the G board application of parsing um, people's writing style and then learning specific models based on how they write, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And then, um, and then next step was um, largely images uh, because of the motivation in medical imaging. Um, I haven't seen FL on like speech yet, but mm -hmm. maybe I haven't looked, looked hard enough. Um, but who knows? I mean, this stuff like evolves so quickly. Uh, FL is like another one where the publication count kind of is going through the roof. Mm -hmm. Um, and I guess, is there any library or, or FL framework that you've been following or, or seeing people really latch on to? I would say open mind probably is the most popular, um, privacy preserving ML ecosystem. Awesome. Yeah. So, uh, with, with the, the bit of time we have left, um, if you were going to impress like one big takeaway, um, for everyone to spend time focusing on and reading about and working with, like, what would, what would that be? I mean, my pet favorite would be like, uh, yeah, machine learning and biology. Mm -hmm. I think it's going to be, it's, it's potentially a little bit hard to understand because you need a lot of, you, you might need a bunch of, kind of background knowledge to this stuff, but, but I think like the surface area for how ML can help everything from just analyzing data in a better way to designing experiments, to, mm -hmm. um, kind of treating biology, uh, as a, as a simulatable problem. Um, as we see with things like AlphaFold and the RNA version mm -hmm. of AlphaFold, that uh, I think there's a huge opportunity for folks in software engineering and machine learning who, um, you know, might be looking for a new problem 
to become increasingly effective at driving like some real value across uh, across the world in the form of medical uh, medical innovations that like can genuinely be unlocked with machine mm -hmm. learning. Yeah, I guess it always goes back to the the hard sciences and things that are really really interesting right now. Yeah, uh, I mean, I want to say it's going to probably be some kind of golden era for this because you know we've all just lived through a huge boom of uh, you know, consumer internet and marketplaces, and uh, I think you know many of the people I meet in those companies are now looking for something like more impactful that they'd like to work on, whether it's mm -hmm. climate or biology or. Um, so I think th those kinds of scientific domains are going to be like a huge beneficiary of this massive talent mm -hmm. move um, from, you know, software 1.0 to software 2.0. Awesome. Yeah. And, and my own parents work in and around biomedical and in the medical industry. And, and I will say that the, the previous big revolution of computer vision and imaging and, and non-invasive imaging did have a, a fairly massive change in how people interacted with it. Yeah, for sure. It's about like democratizing care and, and giving much better care than what we have today. Um, so I think we just have yeah, a lot of potential and a lot of, uh, a lot of like societal necessity to take a good stab at this. So yeah, that's, that's probably what I would impress and what I'm most excited about. So, well, I, I want to thank you so much um, for, for jumping on and talking with us today. I um, really appreciate it and definitely learned a lot about, about AI and, and how you're kind of thinking about the problems. Yeah, pleasure. It was really fun. Thanks a lot. Awesome. Have a great day. Take care, Bye. guys. Bye-bye.